right, howdy. So today, unfortunately, Mike DeVito can't be with us today, um, but we do have a special guest here, uh, Matthew Nelson with Word on Fire. Um, you're all the way in Canada right now, eh? How yeah, are you doing? yeah, you betcha. <laughs> uh, well, you have this, this, this new book, edited volume, New Apologetics is out with Word on Fire um, Press, and it's really interesting, really good. I uh, figure we, we can talk about that today. Uh, when did it officially come out, by the way? Was it last week? Yeah, it just came out last week, beginning of the week. So it's been a, a heavy hitting. And it's already like here. sold thousands, right? I mean, it's it's doing quite well. Yeah. So last I heard, we've sold over 5,000 in the first week, um, which... I, I wish know, my book sold like that. Jeez. <laughs> well, this is no reflection of me. This is the reflection of the Word on Fire marketing platform and, and the names affiliated with the book. So... Uh, props to to all those people and well, you included. Well, I, you put together a fantastic list of contributors. Uh, it, it really felt kind of like almost like a Justice League or you know Avengers Assemble sort of. You know, you just got so many different scholars from so many different you know perspectives uh, together to talk about what what is it forty chapters, you know, forty different issues. We- I think we, we topped out at 41. 41 and then like that's just in the body. So then we've got a forward from Thomas Cardinal Collins in Toronto. Um, and then we've got uh, Bishop Barron with the afterward. And then I've got an introduction in there. So I guess that would, if, if my numbers are right, that's about 44 essays in there. Wow. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Well, you really did a service to the church with this volume, really excited about it. And so I figure we can, we can, we can talk about that uh, today. Um, real quick, any um, uh, initial reactions from your fellow colleagues? Uh, everyone pretty positive uh, about the volume and, and excited for it? Absolutely. I mean, from day one, it started off with us creating this all-star cast of hopeful contributors to the volume. And as I started to reach out to the people that I had slated to to write, we just we were getting yeses and and only yeses and that was encouraging and so this book which was initially supposed to be about half the size you know we got a little bit greedy after the first 20 yeses and thought well gee we should we should keep it going so um you know from the get go we've been we've been really thrilled with the results that we've been getting and ultimately this book is purposed for a mission which is the mission of the church and i think since the book was released last week. It's been, it's been received with welcome arms and there's been a lot of excitement and enthusiasm about what this book could potentially contribute to the new evangelization. Uh, so yeah, can't complain. We're, uh, we'll we'll just pray that our results continue to, uh, to be what they've been so far. Yeah. I mean, you, when you say all-star contributors, I mean, you got from, from my perspective as, you know, person in analytic philosophy of religion world, uh, you got Eleanor Stump, you got Rob Coons, you got Ed Fazer. Uh, I mean, you just you you got uh, some some great biblical scholars as well um, and uh, systematics. So like um, Matthew Ramage, is that how you say his last name? Yeah, I yeah, I, I believe so. Yeah, <laughs> uh, he, he's great. He's been on our show before. Yeah. Uh, he's yep. his stuff on dark passages. I was so excited to see that he was he was in this uh, yep. doing his thing on that because I think yep. he's just so brilliant and and uh, really love his stuff on that. Um, and then, you know, you, you, you just, the, the list just continues. Yeah. So, uh, really, Matthew, really Matthew Levering, Peter Kraft, Francis Beckwith, Ryan T. Anderson. Yeah. Dale Alquist, Michael Ward, <laughs> Turner mean, Nevitt, the, Daniel DeHaan. Just, just, just the list continues. <laughs> it's so, just fun to say the names because it, it, it's really extraordinary that so many people could contribute new, new papers, new essays, to, to one volume and a volume that isn't written just for analytic philosophers or, right. or uh, scholars of the sacred scriptures, but it's, this is a, a book that will appeal to lay Catholics and academics alike. Yeah. I, I mean, I think before we uh, started the official discussion, we were talking about just kind of how unique the volume is and that, you know, it's intended for a wide audience, but you have some of the essays that are actually like pretty technical and, you know, um, uh, really helpful for those who are more seasoned uh, in philosophy of religion or apologetics, right? Um, 
so it, it, um, it allows, I think, for not only the volume to be attractive to um, those who kind of more specialize uh, in the field, um, but also for those who don't kind of just being introduced to high level philosophy um, and uh, I'm sure biblical scholarship as well. So really, really unique volume. I don't know of anything like this. So hat, hat, hat tip, you know, <laughs> once again for you and putting putting this together. Yeah, thank you. Like I said, it was a uh, it was just a real privilege and for me fun from beginning to end. And I shouldn't say end because we continue to to get the book out there and promote the book. And I don't feel quite as self conscious promoting this book because it's you know, as the editor, especially the editor of this caliber of writers and thinkers, it was a very hands-off approach. So um, I'm just kind of the, uh, I don't know, the bat boy to the ball team sort of thing here and just making sure, you know, things get into the right hands of the people we want reading this. And um, and hats off to you for for contributing <laughs> to this book in, you know, you're, you're amongst those who've contributed some serious work to this book. And, and uh, I think that that's important. One of the areas of this book where you find some of the more technical writing is in the, in the science and religion section. And that was uh, intentional because we need to be engaging the best of the best in the scientific realm today in order to, to properly carry out this task of the new apologetics, which is really just a branching off of the new evangelization introduced to us by St. John Paul II. So um, both the technical and more pastoral essays in here, they all fit together uh, quite well. Yeah. And I mean, y'all quote Pope Benedict, right? Where um, he, he talks about, you know, in the new evangelization needing to bring apologetics <laughs> to all aspects of, you know, from the university to the churches to, you know, all things. And, and I think this volume yeah. really does, does that. So, yeah, that, I mean, that what you're quoting is, is included in my introduction. And I thought it was really powerful. Uh, some really powerful words from one of the great Christian intellectuals of the modern period. And somebody who also is a pastor and, and under, you know, he was the pastor of the universal church. And so he, uh, when he was addressing the American bishops, he advocated for apologetics being something that is not just a specialty off to the side for, you know, the quote unquote intellectuals among us or the people who want to do battle with people who disagree with us. But, you know, apologetics is something so integral to the mission conferred upon the church by Jesus Christ that we need to be formed in this task of defending and explaining the faith or giving reasons for the hope that is within us to quote from St. Peter. Uh, we need to be forming people at every level of the church and Catholic society. So that's from the home all the way to the universities and graduate programs. Um, we need, we need everybody to know why they believe what they believe for their own spiritual benefit, but also why they believe what they believe for the benefit of those uh, who were called to uh, preach the good news to in the culture. Right. So let's, let's get into the book. Um, new apologetics. What, 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 why new, right? What's wrong with the old apologetics or, you know, <laughs> what, what, do, what do you mean by new here for, for those who are, who are listening, but haven't read the book? Can you explain yeah. a little bit about the name? Right. It's a good, it's a good question. Um, so there's a few ways that I think about this. Uh, there's, an, there's an obvious sense in which the new apologetics is just a framework for doing apologetics that is tailored to the specific needs of the culture and society we live in today, like right now, compared to five, 10 years ago, 50, 500 years ago. Every moment in history makes its own unique demands on the church and the church needs to respond accordingly. So that's one sense is the new apologetics are just a, a rethinking of old and new subjects within the context needed right now to, to properly uh, evangelize there. Then there's another sense in which it is just meant to 
be understood as a sort of another manifestation of the new evangelization. So the new evangelization includes the charisma and preaching that, that plain and simple message that Christ has, has uh, died for our sins and has rose from the dead and has saved us from our sins. But at the same time, we also need to be ready to engage one another as the very beings that we are, namely rational creatures. And so if we're going to engage people according to the nature that they are, we need to engage them rationally. And that involves uh, making propositions, it involves defending propositions, it involves fielding rebuttals and providing evidence to support the claims that we make. And uh, yeah, and ultimately it involves a uh, pursuit of convincing others to believe what we believe. If we really believe what is true, then we should want people to believe that. And so that's, that's the next sense is that the new apologetics is just an outgrowth, um, a proper outgrowth of the new evangelization and a necessity of the new evangelization. And then finally, there is a sort of personalistic sense. And this is, this is again, coming from St. John Paul II, or at least a theme that he had lots to say about, uh, which has affected my own thinking. And that is when we evangelize, it's helpful sometimes to have a framework to turn to and patterns to follow if we want to be effective evangelists. Sometimes the word tactics is used in, in the apologetics world and, and that has a place. And there's a, I like that in, in some contexts, I like that, the terminology. Um, but you know, Wittgenstein has this line that humans have a craving for generality. And we, we, we tend to want to apply in too broad of strokes sometimes programs for something like apologetics, when really we have to remember the particularities that exist in this world. And the most important particularities that exist in this world are people and every individual person comes to the table with their own experiences and presuppositions and opinions and arguments and rebuttals and tactics. And so we need also to consider the new apologetics to be something that comes alive in a new way with every individual person that we propose our beliefs to and that we engage uh, when they disagree with us. So there's, there's three senses, I think, about the new apologetics. And, and I suppose this book tries to bring all three of them together uh, so that we can properly carry out the task in all those distinct ways. Speaking of which, like chapter one, right? Um, chapter one, you, we, we start with Stephen's Bolan. chapter. Yeah, and, and about sort of like the nuns, right? <laughs> yeah. And so, um, uh, you know, with the nuns, so much has been made, right, in the media about who the, these nuns are. And, and Stephen's just kind of like, guys, there's no easy answer, <laughs> right? Um, they could be anyone. <laughs> Anything from someone having doubts in church to, you know, a staunch atheist to someone who's spiritual but not religious to, um, and it's just kind of like, it's a category, that, uh, you know, exists because, you know, we need to check off certain <laughs> uh, identifying markers and so forth. Um, but what, what, would you, what, what did you, you make of his essay? What, what sort of the, the main point do you think um, we as Catholics should sort of take from that essay moving forward? Yeah, I think what he's saying is something really similar to what I just said a few moments ago. You're right. He doesn't give a silver bullet for understanding how to perceive and engage the, the quote unquote nuns, which I like, I think it was a very, you know, this is an academic who's writing, but he's writing for an audience. I think that he expects to be a wide swath. So from the popular reader to the academic and, and he's writing in a very accessible way. And yet he's writing in a responsible way where, he recognizes when we think about the nuns, we often think about this one generic group that we can attribute properties to and ultimately 
plan for and treat as one kind of thing. And he says that from a sociological perspective, there's some value in taking a group and trying to draw out the, the similarities amongst the people in that group. But at the same time, admitting that there is some efficacy to doing that, it's also essential that we recognize that nuns are also individual people. And so we have to walk this fine line between understanding this group as being one generic cohesive group that can be defined with a simple definition that applies to every person in that group. And yet at the same time, we have to recognize that there is quite a lot of significant diversity within that generic group. And so that also can't be forgotten. Um, so, right. So uh, it's, you it's know, just needing to, to meet everyone, right? That's what I took away from his essay is, yeah, hey, yeah. You're, you want to be an apologist? Don't look at nuns the, uh, all the same. And, yeah. you know, just be prepared yeah. to meet everyone where they're at and get to know them first individually. And, and from that, move forward instead of just thinking, you know, one monolithic group. Um, but here's one thing in common they, they do share, uh, nuns, and that's because, uh, pretty much, um, most of the world now shares this, um, but especially younger people, which n- nuns tend to be, um, that's the internet, <laughs> uh, you know, meeting evangelizing through the internet. So, mm-hmm. uh, curious, um, kind of how you see, I mean, obviously the volume talks about this as well. Um, any thoughts about, about sort of, you know, back in the day, you know, if we, we traveled and we saw, um, uh, you know, the, the saints of old, you know, some of them would be preaching in the villages, right. in the streets. And obviously we see this, uh, in, in Holy scripture as well. And, and, um, you know, I, I myself do this practice. <laughs> I, I street evangelize at times uh, and it is, it can be quite effective, but also for our generation, people are, they're on the internet all the time. So, uh, in a sense, if we're going to participate in the new evangelization, that's, that's a great field to, to work in, right? Yeah, that, that resounds with me for sure. I think that what I would want to say to expand on that is that a nuance, both that approach called for here again. So the digital age provides a lot of new opportunities for us and effective opportunities to reach people in ways that we couldn't have hundreds of years ago when the saints of old were preaching in the town square. But I don't think that the years of uh, preaching in the town square should be over. I think that we should still always remember that the human person is an incarnate being. And so for that reason, we need to look for opportunities, I think, first and foremost, to engage people in person. And, uh, So I don't think that the internet should in any way replace that. But I do think that at the same time, as a church, we need to see where are people right now? You know, some saints, there are stories of some saints that go to the brothel or to the pub to meet sinners where they're at. I mean, the the first example of that within Christian history was Jesus himself. And so... We need to go where people are at. Well, t- today, where people are at largely is in this really strange metaverse, <laughs> so-called, where you can be in a lot of different places at once, and you don't necessarily often have face-to-face contact. That, uh, like You and I at least have that right now, right. but this is still a digital encounter. Right. And if I could choose between doing it this way or sitting with you in a room, I would choose that in a heart, the second right. option in a heartbeat. And I think that, you know, that, that speaks to what you're saying here is the digital age does really provide us with important opportunities. And we need to discern where those uh, opportunities call us. For me, I have a really complicated relationship with Twitter and <laughs> I'm back on Twitter for the third time in my life. <laughs> I, I usually go a few years off of that platform and I renounce it and say never again. And the next thing I know I'm coming back and there's always reasons to justify the return. And, you know, often my reasons for leaving Twitter have more to do with my own virtues slash vices 
than it does with the actual virtues and vices of the internet itself. And sometimes I think I want to project my own responsibility onto other, other programs or other platforms or other people through the internet. But I do think that we need to pr pray for the necessary virtues to be able to engage people where they're at. And that's why like going to the brothels and going to the, to the bars or the pubs is not everyone's calling. And God will call us according to the gifts he's given us and the graces and the virtues that we've developed over time. But I do think that we need to pray for and try to enact a program of developing virtues within ourselves so that we can get online, whether it's Twitter or Instagram or a blog or whatever, and start engaging people there. So you that's a long time. rambling answer to a good question, <laughs> but hopefully I touched a few useful things there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so uh, we've been talking largely kind of about really like what's at the heart of the first section, right? You're, the book's divided into four sections. Yeah. Um, what, what about the second section? Can you tell us a little bit of what that's about and, and maybe pick a paper or two that, that you want to highlight? Yeah, so that's the new models. Uh, that's the new approaches section. So maybe just to give uh, your viewers an idea of just the overall structure real quick, there's uh, four parts to the book. The first part is called new audiences. The second part is called new approaches. The third part is new models. And then the fourth part is new issues. And the new issues segment is broken up into four subheadings, science and faith, psychology and anthropology, theology and philosophy, and atheism and culture. Well, the second part of the book is new approaches. And yeah, there's, there's a lot of really good stuff there. Um, just really quickly, a couple of the essays that come to mind. Two of my colleagues at Word on Fire, um, Andrew Pettiprin and Holly Ordway, both have really interesting essays written there. Pettiprin is an incredibly cultured fellow with you know, zero pretentiousness, which is hard to come by. Whether we're talking high culture or whether we're talking popular culture, uh, he just has so much knowledge number one to understand those worlds but a lot of wisdom as well um in understanding from an evangelical perspective what's happening in those spaces today and how we might go into those spaces and understand those things that we find there through a catholic lens but also how we might use them as tools for the new evangelization by you know um by harnessing beauty and and using that as an entry point so he's got a really good essay there where he, he asked the question, is there any culture today? And he's got some, somewhat of a cynical answer to that. But Andrew always has nuance in his writing and important insights. And so that's a, that's a book that asks some pretty, some pretty big questions. And I think he, he at least begins to answer those questions. And, and finally, through the way he does it, provides a call to action for us and gives us a direction forward. Um, and the other one, Holly Ordway, a world-renowned Tolkien scholar. Yeah, she, um, former colleague of mine. Uh, at oh, at uh, Houston Baptist. There. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Well, Holly uh, is an incredible writer uh, and she is a poet and is a convert from atheism and was one of those atheists that experienced in a big way beauty as that entry point to the faith. Um, I know John Donne's holy sonnet number 14, uh, batter my heart three person God for you is yet but knock, breathe, shine and seek to mend and on and on and on. When she heard that poem, she thought God must exist. If, if, if something like that can be written, God must exist. And that was a really important pivotal moment for her in her journey towards yeah. the Catholic faith. Well, she understands the importance of words in how words can evangelize, but she also understands how words can devangelize. And so in her essay, she talks about a phenomenon she calls verbicide uh, and how it is that we sometimes mur murky the waters a little bit with our, uh, inaccuracies in language or imprecisions. And so there again is another essay that's somewhat of a call to action in revisiting how it is that we actually proclaim the word to people and how it is that we 
speak about the faith, propose it, defend the things that we're proposing. And, and it's just, again, a call to be a little more mindful of how it is that we actually exercise language in the act of apologetics. Yeah, she's great. Um, a bit, big fan of hers. And I think she even mentioned maybe that, was it that Chronicles of Narnia played some sort of role as well? Um, the incarnation and so forth uh, with um, Aslan. I, I, I maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe I'm misremembering something. Oh uh, yeah, that could something. that could be. Um, yeah. <clears throat> she's she's an expert in imaginative apologetics. So yeah. um, she's she's up neck deep in that world, and yeah. uh, cl- and a close friend of Father Michael Ward, who's another contributor to this volume. Who's you know right? This is so fitting. He's a world renowned C.S. Lewis scholar. You know, and she's a She's a prominent Tolkien scholar. So I think probably um, there's a reason why her and Michael have become so close. <laughs> and part of that is just C.S. Lewis's impact on them both. Right. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And when we were at a- HBU, she was teaching all the, the um, uh, like English apologetics, cultural apologetics type courses. And I was teaching a lot of the philosophical apologetics courses. And so nice. uh, our our uh, our interactions were always really good and positive and and uh um i benefit from those yeah um all right so next section chapter three uh, this is a uh, section three sorry um mm-hmm. these are models right if my memory is serving me correctly yep if my memory is serving me correct you're right <laughs> and your eyes are, are not the same. <laughs> yeah it is new models and I mean, there's so much to say about this section. I already mentioned Father Michael Ward, who writes the essay on C.S. Lewis. Uh, Anyone who's in the Chesterton world will recognize the name Dale Alquist, who's kind of the premier North American expert on G.K. Chesterton. Uh, He he writes a really fantastic essay there. Uh, Peter Kraft, I mean, this he is one of my intellectual heroes, and to be able to reach out to him and have him agree to write an essay on Blaise Pascal, who, who he claims is more relevant today than he was in the 17th century when he wrote his pensées. Um, he again takes Blaise Pascal and shows how he's such an important model of doing a pol- an important model for apologists today. Hmm. Um, being, being somebody in the 17th century who was a devout Catholic, but also attempting to to be a devout Catholic and make a case for the faith amidst the enlightenment and the French enlightenment and much skepticism and indifference. And it's a similar cultural scenario to what we find ourselves in today. And so, you know, I've read, so Dr. Kraft has a book on Pascal's pensées, is it Christianity for modern pagans? And it, it might be his best book out of the 5,000 books that he's written. <laughs> but uh, after reading that book and getting an idea of how he makes this case that Blaise Pascal's words 400 years ago or whatever were more, are more relevant today than they were even when he wrote them, um, I, I think he makes a good case for that. And so obviously I had to, in a book like this, I had to at least get down on my knees and beg him to write. And I, luckily I didn't have to beg him too hard. So Wonderful. he, uh, he uh, provided a nice essay there. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's saying something, right. That, you know, that yeah. he's, <laughs> that Pascal is more, more relevant for today than, 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 than he has been in any time, I guess is, 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 is what he's saying. Like that's, that's quite, what yeah. could do, do you recall any of the reasons why he said that? Well, yeah. Like, and this is, you know, this is an interesting thing to throw your way. And maybe you want to comment on this a little bit, but, uh, and I have a more analytic, analytic bent to my sensibilities as well when it comes to philosophy. But uh, one of the things that Kraft argues is that in order to properly reach man, we have to understand man's nature and man isn't just a mind. So if we were just in pure intellect, we wouldn't be man anyways, we'd be an angel, but we are man, which means we, we are bodies as well. And we're psychological entities that, that are also bodies. And so if we're going to evangelize people, uh, we need to address the psychological dimension along with the logical dimension. So 
he talks about reaching the head through the heart. And there is a, a real heart approach to the way Pascal does apologetics. And one of the most profound things that I think Pascal argues for that Dr. Kraft expounds upon is the idea of making Christianity attractive before trying to prove it's true. It's, it reminds me of something Chesterton wrote in, I think it was in the Catholic Church in Conversion. He writes something to the effect of, um, once you, oh, how does that go again? Um, once you become fair to the Catholic Church, you'll become fond of the Catholic Church. Mm. Um, so it's, it's a change of heart that ultimately makes analytical apologetics possible, right. I suppose. So I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but, but I certainly think, especially today where people are much less number one trained in making logical ar argumentation, uh, but also less willing because there's such an emotional aspect to the way people hash out disagreements today that there is this necessity of reaching people through the heart first and then eventually getting to the intellect where we can right. throw premises back and forth. But what do, what do you think? Yeah, no, I think that's for sure true. Um, and definitely like when I mentioned earlier, you know, my, my conversations with Holly and then seeing her work and stuff has, has made me realize that even more so um, for me and my own sake. So I, I was reformed Baptist, right? That's, that's primarily what I was in my young adult Christian uh, life from probably age 17 to, you know, 20, 21, uh, you know, I, I took around like on mission trips, John Calvin's institutes of Christian religion. Like I, I was, I had my, so right now I have a, you can't really see it right now, but I have a, a Gohan t-shirt from Dragon Ball Z. But oh, yeah. then I had my Charles Spurgeon as my homeboy t-shirt, right? <laughs> um, and and, and I, I was, I just would wake up in the morning and be like, ah, yes, you know, reformed. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, that, that was kind of my background. Um, but I, I had a whole bunch of obstacles, objections that I had, right? Like the, oh, the Catholic church teaches you're saved by works, you know, your own merits. Um, uh, haven't they ever read Ephesians two, eight, nine through 10, or, you know, there's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Right. And, uh, so I was just like, I can't believe Catholicism. So mine was sort of, I had like intellectual barriers, but then once those intellectual barriers got shot down right which in part was just because i was like wait a minute there are these catholic philosophers who seem to be like my friends <laughs> um my allies and, and yet like they're really smart um and yet they're they're believing in catholicism like there has to be something something that i'm missing uh, you know surely they've, they've read these passages before right you don't sacrifice jesus over and over again haven't they read hebrews right mm -hmm. um and uh uh yeah, and then once the barriers came down upon investigation, the beauty of the church and the uh, longstanding tradition of the church and the unity of the church um, just was was overwhelming to where, like, doxastically just sort of moved me to start believing in Catholicism. So it was like once the intellectual objections <laughs> were put down, it was, you know— um, uh, really the, 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 the beauty and longstanding tradition of the church that really overwhelmed me. So, uh, um, even if you do approach it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. First off, you know, intellectually, which I, I know is, is, is not the norm for most people, the average person, but even then <laughs> there's still going to be other components, uh, as, as you mentioned, that you know could really move someone to the faith and so I, I, well th what's interesting about that is um that what it sounds like led you to take the intellectual arguments of catholics more seriously was just the fact you were impressed by how smart they were there's something attractive about that that there's this intellectual seriousness that comes with Catholicism. So there is almost that sort of conversion of heart that is implied in that initial attraction to engaging Catholics right. intellectually. Um, but I think it goes back to what we were saying about Stephen's essay there at the beginning of the book that it's, I mean, in reality, these things are messy processes, right? It's like new Newman talking about how we think, <laughs> um, 
it's, it's a messy process and there's all kinds of things at work at one time. And, um, you know, that's, that's, a uh, it's a beautiful testimony you have. And, and, um, it's nice to see you now on the, on the Catholic side of things, <laughs> thinking, thinking analytically, using your gifts to contribute to the new evangelization through a book like this. And, uh, I told you I was going to corner you in this conversation because I want you to talk a little bit about, about your chapter because you and I had talked on multiple occasions before this book was even a conception in my mind, uh, just about Alvin Plantinga and reformed epistemology and what we think of that particular way of, of thinking and how that might apply to a Catholic philosophical right. sensibility. And I think you and I essentially agree on, on this. So I'm, I wanted to have your take on doubt and certainty in this book, but I'd like to, to turn the tables on you and have you talk a little bit about what you contributed to the book. Right. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that. No. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so, so going in the fourth section of the book, right. I mean, this is going to be where for those who, uh, want a lot of meat, so to speak, uh, in reference to arguments for and against stuff, right? That's where this section goes. And like you said, you, you, I, what is it? Psychology and the, uh, psychology, philosophy, yeah, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, you have, uh, essays on the problem of evil, problem of divine hiddenness. I mean, this is, this is a, a really, really great section. Um, yeah, so I have a, uh, my, my, um, very modest contribution to the the volume. Um, talk about certainty, right? What does one mean by certain, right? Certainty. You can mean lots of different things. <laughs> Epistemically certain, psychologically certain, metaphysically certain. Uh, the Catholic Church actually talks about being, you know, metaphysically certain and so forth. Um, so what, what I'm really interested in, though is psychological certainty. And how, how can someone have psychological certainty? Um, that Christianity is true or that Catholicism is true in light of various objections. And so I sort of create, um, if my memory serves me correctly, <laughs> I, I sort of create a model using Reformed epistemology, right, to, to explain how that is. So for those who don't know, Reformed epistemology is just the thesis that religious belief can have positive epistemic status, right? It can be justified or warranted apart from argument. And, you know, Plantinga has his whole census divinitatis model and his extended AC model where the whole, you know, the whole instigation and witness of the Holy Spirit. Where he brings together Aquinas and Calvin. Right, right, right. Yeah. And, and even if you don't like the passages that he quotes from Aquinas there, there are other passages uh, that I think even more, even clearly, uh, more clearly like show that, that Aquinas uh, endorsed the thesis of reformed epistemology. I think it's found in Newman. In fact, I was just giving a talk <laughs> in, in uh, Bologna, Italy, uh, a couple days ago, right, on Newman and being a reformed epistemologist. Um, and uh, I think somewhat Augustine and Plato even. Um, I think it's a long-standing tradition. So don't let the word reformed scare you uh, for those who are watching. And <laughs> well, isn't, isn't it true that uh, Plantinga regretted the right. terminology that he had right. applied to it because of that misconception? Yes, that's right, because he wanted it to be more ecumenical, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, but obviously it's called reform because, you know, a lot of the inspirations found in book one of the institutes with John Calvin talking about the census divinitatis, the sense of divinity. Uh, right. So um, uh, basically talking about how, you know, someone might come to know that Christianity is true or have warrant or justification or be rational and thinking that Christianity is true uh, based off of experience, you know, just looking up at the starry skies and finding themselves believe that God created that. But what happens whenever you have objections, right? And so I, I take objections from cognitive science of religion. Um, you know, how should the person respond to this? And, uh, you know, give various responses to that and, and how they can remain psychologically certain <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. So anyway, that's, that's, that's that essay. What, what, what about other essays that, that are featured? Any other essays you want to highlight? Oh, yeah, there's... There's so many, so narrowing it down is tough. I'll, I'll maybe just speak about one that, you know, selfishly I really enjoyed because it's an area I'm quite interested in, and that's uh, Daniel Dehan's mm. uh, essay on free will yes. and the challenges posed to free will are apparently posed by neuroscience. Um, 
Daniel's a great guy. I've had the chance to work with him on a couple projects and he, uh, um, not big academic projects, but a couple projects at Word on Fire. And uh, he's uh, right now, I think, uh, lecturing. He's a, I don't remember what his exact, like, I don't remember what his exact uh, title is, but he's, uh, for lack of better words, a tenured professor at Blackfire, Blackfriars College at Oxford. And uh, the beginning of his time at Oxford, he, he spent uh, as a researcher in the neuroscience department as a Catholic philosopher. And he's heavily influenced by uh, Alistair McIntyre, uh, uh, really important in my mind, uh, Wittgensteinian philosopher named Peter Hacker, uh, and also an Oxford professor. Um, and heavily influenced by Thomas Aquinas. And so he's taken these various philosophers, heavily Catholic uh, in, their, in their thinking, heavily influenced by Aquinas. And he's attempted to clear up some of the questions and some of the misconceptions and some of the fallacies that are often referenced unwittingly amongst neuroscientists. And this includes when they're doing experiments to determine whether free will exists as though free will is the sort of thing you can determine exists through the scientific method. And of course, that's a philosophical position to, to presuppose that. And so what Daniel does in this essay is he summarizes these famous experiments that were done by Benjamin Libet in the 1980s. And they were so influential on the way that the neuroscience community thought about free will and its existence or non-existence that even up to more contemporary times, public figures like Sam Harris have quoted these limit experiments as somehow making the case that free will is just an illusion. Well, in short, what the limit experiments did was they, through EMG measured, um, electrical activity in the brain, something called a readiness potential. Uh, and they tried to, on a timeline, line up when the electrical activity that they were associating with making a decision, uh, how that lined up with the conscious intention to do a simple movement like a finger, flex, uh, finger flexion or wrist movement or something like that. And like the whole idea of the experiment was to see which comes first, the brain activity and then the conscious decision or the conscious decision and then the brain activity, which obviously would then uh, be followed by a muscle activity. And the way that this data was in interpreted was if the brain activity fires, if the brain activity precedes the conscious volition, then that means that the brain's in control. The brain is in the driver's seat. So whatever feels like conscious volition to us is really an illusion. We're not, we, we're not consciously willing anything to happen. The brain is unconsciously willing us, willing us to then consciously will, or at least feel like we're consciously will, willing uh, muscular movement. And then we move the muscle and there we go. We have this sequence of events. And so when they did these experiments, they found that that readiness potential in the brain that they associated with conscious volition came first. So the conclusion was broadly, I mean, broadly speaking, obviously oversimplifying uh, some more complex analysis of this. The conclusion was, well, if the brain fires first, which it apparently does, then that means that the brain's in control, which means that we're not truly in control of actions that feel voluntary to us. So free will therefore doesn't exist. And Daniel just goes and he kind of breaks, again, breaks these experiments down, exposes the weaknesses of the experiments, and then poses questions. And this is where it's really valuable for apologists, poses important questions about whether or not we even have our understanding of what free, free will is right if we're going into these experiments with a faulty conception of free will, then we're testing for the wrong things right from the get-go. So we're not really proving anything for or against free will. Um, 
as well as some other important questions about how free will seems to operate and whether or not these experiments could even touch free will and, and tell us the sorts of things that they're trying to tell us. Um, so it, there's some complexity and technicality to that essay, but um, again, 100, you guys were all given 1500 words as a max limit. And that's, uh, that's almost an inhumane request that I made on all of you guys. So for, for only a 1500 word essay, Daniel does a really good job of breaking the problem down and then proposing some, some questions and some useful uh, action items that apologists can use today when this pretty common and prevalent idea that free will is an illusion presents itself. No, I thought it was, I thought this chapter was great. And if my memory serves me correctly, again, you know, um, I think he, 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 one of the things he says is like, Hey, we're, we're trying to you know, judge movement of like a finger <laughs> being lifted. Right. Um, but this has nothing about when we're thinking about highly technical and abstract things and we're sort of you know, do we have freedom to, to, you know, do deliberation and so, so on and so forth re re regarding these higher, more important matters. Right. And it doesn't say anything to that. I, th I think he says something like this. And I, I, I think, I think that was quite worth something to think about. Yeah. I mean, that's, that gets to the crux of one of the major problems of the experiments is that the subjects were asked to flex their finger upon an urge to do so and they could choose not to follow through with the urge and what was interesting is if they if they chose not to act on the urge they found that the brain activity followed rather than preceded um that conscious decision not to flex the finger so that's the opposite of what they found when you actually followed through with the urge so what they concluded was we don't have free will but we do have free won't <laughs> But on top of that, getting to what you were just saying, when we think about free will, especially when we think about it from a Thomistic perspective, um, there's this, like you say, this important aspect of deliberation where our will follows upon the intellect, right? And so most of the time when we're willing some, like when we're carrying out an intentional action, we've thought about what we want to do and then we've acted upon those thoughts. And so we don't typically consider just carrying out an urge um, to be something that is really a great exemplar of what it means to act with free will. So it, 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 these experiments weren't testing at all what happens when we consider options consciously and then choose an option and carry it out. It was only measuring what happens when we just wait for an urge and then act on the urge. There's a big uh, distinction to be made between those two things. But the other thing is, and this is another thing that Dan mentions in the essay is free will is much more, I guess we could say again, more to, much more of a messy process. It's not, it's not as clear cut often as just like, Here's the starting point of when I started willing this thing. And then here's the end point where the willing stops and the action gets carried out. Most of the time, our intentions are nested, to use Dan's words. So when that person was sitting there, they had agreed to sit down in that chair and flex their finger when they felt the urge. And they agreed to flex their finger when they felt the urge if they wanted to and they agreed to not flex their finger if they didn't want to when they felt the urge and they had different reasons for willing to be there they when you think of all the different aspects of free will that were potentially at play when a subject sat in the chair they might have been simultaneously willing to be there they might have been willing to participate in that experiment because they willed to impress the lab assistant that was working in the office. They might have been willing to complete that particular particip participation in that experiment because they willed to get the credit for their class that they would get a free credit for. Or, you know, so there's a lot of different reasons why they might have willed to be there and to participate in that flexion of the finger because they willed to get on the good side of the lead investigator because they hope to be involved in an experiment on the side of the lab in the future point is when we carry out 
freely willed actions, there's often a nesting of things we're willing all at the same time. And there's just no possible way that brain imaging, no matter how uh, elaborate it is, it becomes no matter how subtle the information is that it becomes there's just no conceivable way that brain imaging could ever expose all of those different intentions yeah. in in action at one time so um again there's there's so much to be said but often you know in our culture the claim that free will doesn't exist and that neuroscientists have proven it i mean that that it's simplistic it's, <laughs> yeah and that's usually the extent of the argument right Right. Well, we know we don't have free will because right. neuroscience. Do you even find this in, in like analytic philosophy circles, like uh, papers or conferences where, you know, someone will just say something like that? Um, you know, well, we all know free will, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, as we normally conceive, you know, um, it doesn't exist. Uh, and maybe a little quote, um, love its uh, uh, research and so forth. And it's just like, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about this for a minute. Yeah. Um, well, I also want to give a shout out, like I said, Matthew Romage's uh, piece. Uh, I just really think his work on on evil, or sorry, on um, hard passages, dark passages uh, from the Old Testament um, mm -hmm. are really good. And he, he has this new um, book out as well on evolution and yeah. uh, the church's teaching and so forth. And uh, I just really think he's a, a uh, he's one of my favorite thinkers right now, you know, um, and then uh, obviously everything from Phaser and Stump and Coons, you know, it's, it's going to be great stuff. I mean, yeah. you're, you're not going to go wrong with that. So Coons just wanted is the to one, go ahead. He, he, I think he might, sorry to interrupt you, but I was just going to say, uh, Robert Coons might be the one person who I allotted more space because <laughs> <laughs> He, he initially had the 1500 word max, like everybody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I tasked him with the essay on quantum mechanics and how that applies to Catholic apologetics, or Christian apologetics. And uh, I got back the 1500 word essay and I was like, this is really good. But if anybody deserves more space to flesh this out a little bit, I think you do. So I can't remember how much more space I gave him, but he was very gracious and humble. And, you know, some, sometimes doing something of this stature, um, you feel a little bit out of your league dealing with some of these people, but um, every contributor to this volume was so gracious and, and willing to cooperate with the process and um, willing to give their, their time, which, you know, granted you and everybody else, you guys are busy and you're going to, you know, you're going to Italy to talk about Newman and you're, you know, you're in Dallas now and you're, you know, I'm sure traveling again next week, and, going to Cambridge. Yeah. <laughs> sweet. Can I come? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, I have a feeling my, my, uh, my beautiful wife might, uh, might let it happen <laughs> this time, but maybe someday. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I'm just very thankful that all of you guys were and gals were willing to contribute such high quality work, but amidst such busy schedules. Uh, and, and it, so it came together fun. wonderfully. And, and yeah, obviously Coons on quantum mechanics and this Aristotelian take and, and his Aristotelian view of science and the, the impossibility of getting away from Aristotle and science. And it's just, you can't go yeah. wrong with that. You can't go wrong with that. It's great stuff. Yeah. Um, and it's just the book it is highly recommended and uh, it does a great service for, for the church. So thank you very much for putting it together and uh, you know, um, God bless you. And it, real quick, before I let you go, um, do you want to shout out anything that you're working on now or going to be working on in the future? Yeah. So I'm working right now on, um, uh, another, uh, book project with another publisher, uh, I've got a, a lot of interests uh, in the realm of human nature. So that's free will, consciousness, um, human action, stuff like that. And um, I think that philosophical anthropology is a really important area of, of research and, and just thinking and communicating the, the things that we, that we know and the things we could potentially discover uh, from a Catholic perspective in, in, hopefully passing on some wisdom to this deeply troubled world about the human person. So I, uh, I'm, I'm pretty busy uh, now getting into some work on that philosophical anthropology aspect of things. And uh, 
so that's kind of what I'm working on as far as a, a focus. And then, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm on Twitter and Instagram. So if you want to, I'm a big book geek and I'm always sharing the different books that I, well, why aren't you on Facebook reading. by the way? I mean, that's... I used to, so again, complicated relationship with social media platforms. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so much good philosophy back and forth happens, you know, on I've, heard, I've heard that I, I maybe need to reevaluate and jump on Facebook for the 10th time, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but we'll see. I, uh, uh, I, I'd like to think four kids later and, you know, eight year or nine years of marriage that I'm a bit wiser and maybe a tad more virtuous than I once was. So maybe, I still have a long way to go in all those departments, but uh, maybe maybe now is a better time for me to complete the triad and jump on Facebook as well. So it beckons, it calls you, it calls you back <laughs> to return. Yeah, and it sounds mysteriously like Tyler McNabb's voice, but um, we'll uh, <laughs> we'll see what happens. All right, man. Well, thanks so much for your time for taking. I know you're super busy, so thanks so much for taking your time and. Um, and uh, we, we hope to have you back on in the future. And I hope personally to hang out with you in the future. So yeah, it'd be great. You. God bless you too. Thanks, Tyler.